spinnerfish video, um, take a look at some of the things that Neil Shubin um, did to direct his research, and then also look at some of the background um, evidence that already existed before he found his fossil evidence. So um, in the first part, I just want to think about uh, what he as a scientist was looking for um, uh, and what he was thinking about before he chose his place to search for fossils. Um, so there's a couple questions. Um, how does the scientist choose what to look for? How do they pick a dig site? Um, and what proven assumptions is this based on? Meaning um, they're looking for something uh, anatomically. That he was looking for the transition from a fish with just front fins to upper arms. So there's something anatomically that he's looking for. Um, he's got to pick a specific site to dig at. So he's got to find the right age of um, uh, rock layer to dig into. And um, he's using some proven assumptions to back up where he's searching. So there's other people that have found other fossil evidence in Lair's rock at a certain age. Um, so it's gonna let him know the time period and where uh, to look around for what he wants to find. So um, using prior research, um, scientists will look at fossils that have been found so far. So for Neil Shubin, he used the fish skeletons um, that were remnant fish that uh, could live in both land and water, and then fossilized stegas, um, that's the uh, fish with front forelimbs and flat heads. Um, he used those as a starting point. Um, this let him know the time period, so he knew when in time, how many million years ago, he would have to look for his fossil. Um, and then knowing that time period allows him to narrow his focus. He doesn't have to search the whole globe for you know a, a three inch fossil. He's looking in a specific area. So the second part um, uh, that prior research is going to help with is, is finding the right rocks. So he's going to look for ones that are the right age in time, the right type. So you saw in a reptile video that when he was looking for bones, um, they stayed away from things like the um, lava areas because th th those wouldn't have bones um, or fossilized evidence of anything, or at least he didn't think. Um, and then the third thing, in the first video, um, you saw how he looked through the Pennsylvania roadway. Um, he had the right age of rock, and that was a good spot because of the exposure. The land had been blasted to put roads through, so he didn't have to dig through soil. He's looking right at exposed rock of the right age. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit more and clarify why fossils. Um, so the reason they use the fossils is that all the other soft tissue, after even hundreds of years, starts to disappear. Um, and the only thing that's left over long periods of time are fossils. So um, one thing that's really important and it, it allows the, the science of evolution to be possible, uh, one fact that's always been proven is that bones always match the layer of rock that they're found in. So um, if you're looking at a Devonian skeleton, so from that time period, they're always going to be found in rock of the same age. If scientists were looking and they found, you know, a human fossil in Devonian rock, there'd be a huge problem because then the array of that tree of life wouldn't match up with time periods. But we don't ever see that. Scientists are always finding the skeletons in the right layers of rock. Um, second part is, uh, is how much fossils can show. So uh, scientists can learn the anatomy and diet. Uh, you know, even from something as simple as a tooth, uh, they can connect that to how those ancestors lived, what, you know, what they were eating, um, what was around during that time. And they can connect form and function. Um, the fossils are trapped in layers of rock in specific places on the planet. So that allows them to know geographic location. So, just like if you looked um, for, let's say, uh, uh, you know, a million years from now or a hundred million years from now, if you're looking at small mammal, mammal skeletons, you might find raccoons all spread throughout North America. So you, you'd see in, in, in the different variations of that species, you'd see them in a specific location. Um, so that allows you to see kind of progressions and changes um, 
of one specific organism. And then the third thing that fossils show are a connection to time. Because we can age the rock um, and the layers of earth that are, uh, the fossils are found in, we can connect that time to the time that that animal was alive. So I found like a, what I think is a pretty nice example of, of looking at both the time period, so you can see how many million years uh, in time you are, and then also the skeletons have been found. So now these aren't perfectly complete pictures. If you look at the time period, this is going from 420 to 360 million years ago. We're talking millions of years, but um, we do have skeletons of animals and we have intermediate skeletons all the way going from a ray fin fish that's got the bony skeleton and has got the lungs but has no limbs um, and then to the transitional fish that have the four limbs you can look at the bone structure so they've highlighted on the right hand side um, <clears throat> the one bone two bone many bones and digits you can see that developing through time in each of those skeletons. Um, so here we had, so we had this specific example. So now I want to look at some background. Uh, that was kind of the third part. What is what is the background? What is the historical context um, for what he's looking at? So um, there's a guy in the 1800s called Sir Richard Owen, and he was uh, doing what's called comparative anatomy. So that's when um, People are doing all kinds of expeditions all over the world, and they're, they're sending back bone skeletons to him. And he's looking at these bone skeletons of things like bats, whales, cats, and humans. And though they look completely different on the outside, he's looking at these fundamental things, and he just notices that um, they're basically just variations on a theme. What he's meaning is that here that we've got that one bone, two bone, many bones and digits example, you can see them preserved in all four of the mammal species. So cat, human, whale, bat, they've all got that same pattern and you've got extensions or contractions of the bones. So in your mind, if you're trying to think of those bones um, being different sizes and different organisms, think about the single gene sonic hedgehog, how it, if it was turned up or turned down, you're seeing many digits or few digits. You could think of a similar gene interacting and increasing or decreasing bone length. So um, some more discoveries that kind of laid this foundation for um, what Neil Shubin found. Um, Thomas Huxley and Carl uh, Gegenbauer in the mid 1800s again, um, they're looking at lungfish. Um, there, it's a species of fish that lives, currently lives in Australia and also in South Africa. Um, it looks like a cross between the fish and an amphibian. So living today, but it looks like it's trapped somewhere in time between a fish and an amphibian. Um, <clears throat> the lungfish doesn't have the one bone, two bone, many bones. Um, you can look at the bone structure there um, by the fish and you can see it's just got that single bone. It, it looks more, it looks kind of fin like, but it's got a long extended bone. These lungfish could breathe in the water and they can also breathe on land and they can use their limbs to crawl across the ground. So um, this is maybe a distant ancestor of some of those um, four-legged fish that arose hundreds of millions of years ago. So um, Owens found uh, a species called Eusterpinon in Quebec. And he found it in rocks that were about 300 million years old. And what it let Neil Shubin know is that the first upper, out, upper arm area, so this was um, <clears throat> a fish that had kind of a fully developed arm already. It had all the bones. Um, so he knew that he had to look in earlier Devonian age rocks. So this is an example. This is what the bone uh, of that Eusterpinon looked like. Um, it already had the one bone, two bones, many bones um, that Shubin was looking for. And then here, here you can see again um, uh, another example of that lower limb. 
So um, two other um, intermediate fish, uh, Ichthyostega and Acanthostega, um, these were good intermediates, but they already had the fully formed limbs. Um, Acanthostega had a primitive limb that was kind of shaped like a flipper um, and already had a primitive wrist. So Shubin knew that it was already, you know, spending a lot of time on land. So um, he had to go a little bit older, um, a little bit further back in time. So if, if the fully formed arm is already existing in rocks with Ichthyostega and Acanthostega, he's got to go to a little bit older organism. Here's another, this was a picture of those. Um, here, here's the exact fossil um, of the Acanthostega. And this is what it would look like if it were um, actually alive. Um, so Neil Shubin's finds are in Devonian era fossils. Um, so his first search, he searches the, the roadside in Pennsylvania. Um, and then finds the kind of shoulder gir girdle. And then he continues looking in the Arctic area in Canada. Um, and that's where he finds a specimen um, that's got the flat head. It's got one bone, two bone, lots of bones, fingers pattern. Um, and it was the very first one, the very first fish with a wrist, meaning it's spending a lot of time on land. And it's got to be able to support its own weight. Um, that's the picture that's from the, the movie when he kind of uncovered the nose. Um, this is the actual fossil specimen of um, the Tiktaalik that they found. Um, that's the end of this, the show. Um, so we'll be going back over this in class and going over any questions you might have.